So Matt's a friend I've known for several years, based over in Canada and is known in lots of places as being one of the biggest HR gurus for basically making HR cool and, and making things modern and based on technology. So Matt, if you could maybe explain, you said you'd talk about how to uh, profit from data and how to use data and, and all of the options available to companies that they maybe don't know about that are yeah. obviously legal and within GDPR. First off, thanks for the invitation. It's awesome to chat and uh, I hope I can make HR cool by the end of this conversation. It, it, data is an interesting conversation for a few reasons. The first one is that when you look at the human resources function specifically, the function in the profession is probably 15 years behind your traditional marketing functions and organizations insofar as their use of data. And I say that because my background includes 20 years in the corporate world, 15 of those in HR, and the last five as an HR executive, where I was asked to, among other things, lead a lot of large transformational projects. And that's fancy corporate lingo for either mass layoffs or uh, mergers and acquisition, business type initiative involved hundreds, if not thousands of people. And over the course of time, it became pretty clear that data was an element in those organizations that we simply just weren't leveraging. I worked in an organization that had a significant revenue, had significant expenditures behind setting up an analytics suite. So we would track 76 unique data points every single week. And then we would produce a monthly report that would go to the entire organization. And it covered a whole bunch of really cool information. Here was the challenge. It stopped there. So we put out the report and we circulated it and people digested the information, but it became a giant finger pointing exercise because everyone was trying to shirk responsibility for the number or was questioning the validity of the data. And we weren't actually spending the time to dig into what was driving the result and look at the root cause problem. My approach to data and to analytics really starts with the psychology behind it. The data that's present in most organizations today, people are aware of it. What I help them do with our organization is help them make use of it and help them leverage the information they already have, which is just so important today because most organizations are at an inflection point. Coronavirus clearly has had a major impact on our global economics. And as a function of that, organizations are looking to address big problems like operational continuity and the longevity of their firm in a, in a virtual world. So they don't have the the, the capacity or the bandwidth to take on a whole bunch of incremental type initiatives in addition to just managing the status quo. So data provides a really cool opportunity to leverage the information that you already have. And you can work with partners like us or other partners that we can work with you in a very unintrusive kind of way and help make the most sense of the information that you do have so that you're able to get the maximum value out of it. So let me give you kind of an example of that to kind of bring it all together. I always start with the problem that I'm trying to solve. So if you're an organization and profitability is a concern, which it is for most organizations, a big factor that drives profitability in most organizations, especially ones that have a lot of frontline resources or frontline employees, is turnover. And you look at industries like retail or transportation or hospitality, turnover is a significant component of their cost because their business models are predicated on turning over employees at a high rate of speed. In the future, especially in a, in a post-coronavirus, you know, reality, I don't know that that model is as sustainable as it once was because it's predicated on a whole bunch of people coming in and out of an organization very quickly. I think things are going to have to be different. And I think that organizations are going to have to be more thoughtful and intentional about the data that they use. So if you start with the problem of turnover and you look at where you have trends in terms of what types of people, you know, roles, tenure, positions, departments, what roles are turning over most quickly, then we can begin an analysis on what are some of the factors that are driving that historical turnover. And then where the real sweet spot comes in for us is when we start to use predictive analytics, which is to use the history of what has happened to inform the future. And then we're able to have proactive conversations with employees that fit the profile of those who have previously left. And we can have a conversation with them about how their experience has been in the organization and what they're learning and, and where they see opportunities. And in those cases, we can potentially save people that would have otherwise turned over based on the data and keep a number of things present. Yes, you, you're going to save money, which will help your profitability. That's a key piece. Even an incremental improvement in turnover has a material effect on your profitability. 
I think more importantly now though, I worry about things like operational continuity, keeping business, keeping the lights on and the loss of institutional knowledge. It's really hard to ramp somebody else up when they're just joining your organization. So you have to factor in not only the cost of somebody leaving, but the cost to the organization of bringing somebody on and that knowledge gap between the person who's left and the person who is joining. And if that person's in a sales role or a revenue generating function role, you can expect a reduction in performance, at least for a period of time until they get to full capacity. All of those things occur as the result of turnover. So anything we can be doing to reduce that is seen as positive for a whole bunch of different reasons. I get really passionate about this because Erica, I think you, you know my background. I come from a blue collar background. So um, I'm used to having to work within constraints. I've worked in roles in organizations that politely are frugal, if I could say that. And what I mean by that is, and how that translates into practical terms is that as a head of HR, so as a senior leader in the organization, I never had the experience where my operating budget increased year over year. It never happened in the 20 years I was in the corporate world. It always went down because in HR, a lot of organizations view them as a pure cost center. It's an administrative overhead. And any money you spend in HR comes at the expense of diverting funds to revenue generating functions like sales, like marketing. So therefore HR is in a constant battle to justify their own existence. That's another reason why I very aggressively started to pursue the use of data because I knew that in order for HR to maintain and to, to develop relevance in an organization, we needed to quantify what exactly we were doing. Uh, and that's been a challenge for the HR profession since I've been in it. We historically have had a difficult time wrapping our head around how we blend the qualitative and the quantitative. You know, I remember 15 years ago in HR, when we started having these conversations around data, it was viewed as the salvation of the profession that we were going to be able to incorporate and integrate data into our daily practices. And therefore HR professionals would become strategic partners in organizations. Uh, so there's lots of hand wringing and conversations and, and, and manifesting to get to this future of data enabled HR. And if I look forward 15 years later, uh, I can tell you that the majority of organizations that I still talk to never made that gra never graduated to that point. They have the data now. So the issue isn't they don't have data. The issue is they have too much. And in a lot of cases, organizations have continued to position them as administrators or as compliance arms of, of a company. Uh, and as a function of that, they've just produced really beautiful scorecards, but again, haven't been able to advance to a strategic you know, use of that information. And that's where I've really worked hard in my own practice to, to integrate that in a business focused way, because I, I have seen the value of the data. And for me, it's, it's a very simple process. So the question I get most often at on webinars or speaking at conferences or even in my LinkedIn inbox when it comes to analytics is, Matt, where do you start? So it's a really great question because there's a lot of information out there. You can read the Harvard Business Review and you know, The Economist and cl click on LinkedIn and you can find no shortage of people espousing you know, all the great things that you can do with analytics. And the fact of the matter is that most people aren't in a place now where they can do very you know, elaborate visualizations or have predictive indices that go several you know, months, if not years into the future. Most people are just starting out with basic business metrics and they may have a really fancy spreadsheet they've invested in, but that is the, that is the reality. And that's even in the case in the Fortune 1000. We're talking about AI, we're talking about analytics, but the majority of companies are still working their way to that. And I, I want to be sensitive to that because, you know, we, we talk a lot about this future facing state and I want to help people get to that state, but you have to start from where you're at. So the first question I ask myself in any organization, so if I was to walk into your organization right now, Erica, and, you know, go into Crypto Curry Club and you say, hey, Matt, I want to make better use of my data. Where do I start? The first question that that would be and the answer I would give to you is what's the problem that you're trying to solve? what are we trying to get at? Is it a turnover problem like we just talked about? Or is it a problem around revenue generation? You're looking to, as an organization, generate more revenue. Perhaps you're looking to have more people attend webinars like this based on the emails or the messages that you're sending to them. There's a, lot, there's a whole host of problems that you can solve within an organization. But the key thing is you have to be clear on what you are trying to solve. That's the first point. And you'd be surprised how many individuals want to stand up an analytics practice without a clear problem statement. And that's a significant challenge because in order to have a robust analytics strategy in any organization, you need organizational buy-in. That includes the CFO, the CIO, your founders, potentially your board. You want that level of buy-in because as you begin to tell the story through data, you're going to need the commitment from those resources to provide additional support to help address the root causes. 
So having the clarity in mind is key. And I would just further add that having that problem that is linked to an actual organizational or agenda item is just so critical. Right now, given the coronavirus, a lot of organizations, as I mentioned, are discussing operational continuity. Makes sense. People are looking at how do we survive over the next three to six months in a world that has now changed overnight. Great conversation, great topic. HR people with through data can help organizations solve that. Now is not the time likely to bring up a conversation around recognition. I love recognition. It's important. I think we, it, it fuels workplaces and it fuels culture, but there's a place and a time for everything. So ensuring that your strategic in, initiative that comes on the agenda is relevant to what's happening now today in your organization is so key. So if I was going to start building an analytics practice and our challenge was operational continuity, what do you think the first thing I'd bring to the board would be is, Hey, I want to send up an analytics suite. We have a significant problem in this organization around operational continuity. Here's what the data right now tells us about operational continuity. Now in HR, we have a fancy term called strategic workforce planning, which is really just another fancy spreadsheet where we use to predict where we're gonna need resources in the future based on historical turnover, based on known events like promotions or retirements, or perhaps changes in business units. You can predict to a certain degree of accuracy what the future is gonna look like. And inevitably, you're going to have a delta. You're going to find that your turnover will open up holes in your organization over the course of time. And you need a strategy on how to backfill those particular holes. And we essentially um, bucket those solutions into three key areas. The first one is, is that you can buy the talent, which means you can go up to the market and recruit and use headhunters or your networks to be able to procure talent and bring them into the organization. That has speed attached to it, but it also is most costly because the market, you're paying market rates for individuals. So you're always balancing that you know, speed versus cost. Uh, the second way and the most common way people solve for opportunities or for gaps in organizational talent is they build it. They develop talent from within. They promote people, they, they go through succession, they develop them. That plan is takes longer in most cases because people don't learn things overnight. And when you're growing talent in an organization, you're constantly developing and training them but it costs less than bringing somebody in from the market. Because generally speaking, when you enter an organization, you're then receiving increases that are below market rate increases for your position. Um, that may be different now, of course, with coronavirus, but traditionally when you stayed longer in an organization, you would fall further and further behind the market rate for your role. So organizations were incentivized to be able to develop people internally as a mechanism of one, ensuring that they had cultural alignment. These people have fit, they've had success in your company, so it makes sense to invest in them. And it's a less expensive alternative, albeit it comes slower. And then the third thing is, is that you can borrow. And this, Erica, is for me really, really interesting because now we're going to see, I think, a major intentional move towards leveraging the gig economy. Traditionally, most organizations have not worked a lot with freelancers or gig-based workers or consultants other than for large transformational projects. And they would have called in the big four, the EYs, the McKinsey's, the Deloitte's. But the majority of companies preferred to hire full-time equivalents, bring the work inside. We have control over it. We'll hire employees to do the work. I think now you're going to see a change in that as, as, as employers get wise to the fact there's a global you know, employment workforce out there that's able to do great work remotely um, where you don't have to worry about standing up an internal organization to be able to support it, but you can leverage the external resources to be able to, to fill that. So I think that in and of itself is, is an interesting dynamic. As we go back into the data conversation, the ability for us to be able to pinpoint the number of people that we need in the future allows us to be strategic about what resources we put up against that particular uh, initiative. It allows us to determine, do we have enough internal recruiters to fill those spots internally? Do we have enough budget set aside for the wages to go out to the market? Do we have enough people in the internal pipeline to backfill those roles? It illuminates opportunities that you would otherwise butt up against and have to react to if you weren't looking into the future. And when we talk about the idea of data and profitability, it's as much about trying to extract the value that you currently have in the organization to become more efficient so that you can spend your finite resources and the things that actually do drive revenue. Because when you are looking at problems like turnover, like the loss of productivity, more often than not, you can build plans to offset those risks. And if you don't, you're missing an opportunity to recuperate revenue, to reduce your costs. And therefore, you're essentially just flushing money down the loo. And I, I prefer to avoid that as a professional that, again, if you go back to my example of being a head of HR with a reducing budget year over year, 
if I have finite resources and the budget's shrinking, I'm incentivized to find ways to become more efficient in terms of how I operate my business and how I operate the organization. Um, because if we're able to find those savings, then we're able to make the incremental investments in other parts of the business that are able to drive revenue. And what I would add on that one example, Erica, would be is if we're automating manual administration. So if you have employees right now spending six hours a day behind a spreadsheet and you can be automating that work and have AI do that work for you, if you can have the work be automated through workflows and notifications and nudges and not have to have administrators follow up on spreadsheets and check, check boxes, you can deploy resources to other things that are actually going to drive value. Maybe they're customer facing, maybe it's social media, maybe it's PR, things that are actually going to help drive awareness, drive revenue and not check the boxes. Cause we're not getting as an organization, the value for that spend when we have technologies that can do the work faster, more accurately and a lower cost. And I know that's weird for an HR person to say that, but it's the reality we find ourselves in. We can talk about how, everyone should have a job and it's important that everyone has employment. And I believe that, but I also am aware of the, of the reality that we find ourselves in today. And if we're choice to have to find efficiencies in an organization to help preserve the longevity of the firm going forward to benefit the most amount of people, then I think that's a wise decision to make. And the data in and of itself will help tell that story, paint that picture, help you build that plan. And ultimately will help you D develop and architect the organization for the future that's most aligned with your values. Otherwise, you're making a series of subjective gut instinct type decisions. And I, my experience has taught me that whoever is making those calls, the accuracy rate just simply isn't as high as when you do that and you blend the data to kind of balance off and, and quantify that particular example. So that for me is a, is a really important distinction as we talk about the use of data in organizations. And just to recap, we've now talked about regrettable attrition and the opportunity for us to offset the loss of, of people in the future and to be able to recoup that savings. We've also talked about strategic workforce planning and the opportunity for us to illuminate vacancies in the future to prevent issues around operational continuity and to reduce institutional brain drain and to potentially ensure that you have the right people in the right spots at the right time. So that's another key part of that. And then I think one other thing I look at, and this is a very HR type conversation, but I think it's relevant for everyone, which is that organizational learning, institutional digital learning is going to have to evolve. And whether you're a post-secondary institution like the London Business School or an organization like Bento HR, you're going to have to find ways to communicate and transfer knowledge digitally because you're not going to be able to rely on putting people all into the same room and throwing up 40 PowerPoint slides and expecting them to memorize everything which by the way, never worked before anyway. I don't know about you, Erica, but I don't learn by PowerPoint slides and, and you know dictation. I'm an experiential learner. I need to do the work. I need to get involved and get my hands dirty. And you just don't get that when you're broadcasting information through a one-way source, which is why I think today is, it's, I'm excited about the seven questions that are now in the Q&A because it gives us a chance to kind of go back and forth and have a real you know, a dialogue. So I think I'll finish this point and then open it up for questions that we can go back and forth with the group. I think that's important from a learning perspective. Organizations spend a lot of time and a lot of energy in their training programs, a lot, whether it's onboarding or it's retraining or it's management or leadership skills. There's this prevailing belief that if I send you off to training, you're going to come back as a better person. And that may be true, but the retention of learners in a face-to-face -face facilitated workshop isn't rarely that high. It's only when they start to apply the knowledge and take things back and ask questions and engage in activities and engage in peer-based and community-based learning when you start to see the retention of the knowledge go up. And why I share that is because one measure I put into most organizations that I've worked in is a measurement around the efficacy of training. If we're going to spend, a, if we're going to spend six or seven or eight figures a year from an organizational perspective on learning, you should make sure you measure the ROI of those initiatives. <laughs> And I, I joke because that's not a step that many organizations have taken. They simply throw the money at training. And if they have a training problem, they just simply throw more money at it. And as I mentioned before, if you have finite resources that you're spending, every dollar you're allocating towards training that's not being useful is money you could be spending in other parts of your business that could be leveraged to drive revenue, that could be leveraged to reduce turnover, that could be leveraged to drive engagement in your organization. But because you're focusing on throwing money at training kind of blindly, you're not getting those returns. So 
what we would do in that case is we would establish some baseline metrics that we think are going to be influenced when someone goes through training. So the easy example, Erica, would be as a salesperson, you know, you're a sales team member and you have obviously your scripting, you have your technology, you have your probably have call targets or contact targets. You're able to assess someone's performance with real key, you know, metrics, productivity metrics and result metrics before training. Then you send them to the actual training itself and then you assess what their performance looks like after the training and over a sequence of perhaps one week, one month, three months, six months. And you see the delta of the individual who's gone through the training and you compare them against the people that have not gone through the training. And you should be seeing a significant ROI. If I'm going to spend a week or you know two weeks putting you in a classroom, giving you learning, giving you investment, that's a significant amount of investment from an organizational perspective. I want to see a corresponding lift in your sales KPIs. And if I'm not, then I know my training is not working. So if you're, if you're running training sessions as a mechanism to make everybody feel good, but not to actually learn anything, then you've nailed it. But if you actually want people to learn stuff, you may have to redesign the delivery methodology, the types of content. You may have to elongate the training over a period of time, put more practical examples in, include more gamification using technology. The cool thing is, is that we have all the technology in place today to do this. We have the ability to, to conduct learning that is very valuable, very interactive, very engaging with technology today. But the majority of people who are just making decisions at the business level around training don't have that knowledge yet because it's exploded so quickly over the last 10 years. They're still stuck in this mentality of the traditional way of teaching lectures, PowerPoints, memorization. You read this, you're responsible for knowing this. My responsibility is, is to tell you once. And once I've told you, now you're accountable for being able to apply it in real life which just simply isn't, isn't reality. So in using the analytics here to measure the efficacy of your training, you have an opportunity to squeeze out the incremental value of that content by employee surveys, how they're performing, and then most importantly, what their business results are as a result of that training. And for an HR person, that's really important because if I'm justifying that particular spend, I'm able to demonstrate in business metrics, in revenue, we're investing this much money and we can realize an improvement in someone's performance by X percentage and then calculate that with revenue. We can offset the cost of the training with the improvement that's achieved by that resource. And if you can build a compelling enough business case, and Erica, for me, this would be, if you can build a business case that demonstrates that the person actually gets, delivers more revenue to the company in the same fiscal year as the training per cost to provide, anything incremental to that is a really strong ROI. So if we're going to spend 5,000 pounds to put you in training for two weeks, but you're able to deliver 50,000 pound extra incrementally to your cohort by the end of the year because of the training, I've got a 10 to one ROI on the investment. I'm excited about it. If it's one to one, I'm asking myself, how do I tweak it and use the data to tell the story and validate the efficacy of the decisions that we've made? So those are three examples of how I've used data in the past, trying to extract more value out of an organization. How AI and chatbots help you to allow your data to speak? Love this question. And I love chatbots because this is like, to me, the great analogy between chatbots in organizations and the great correlation is bank tellers 15 years ago. I remember like my parents and my grandparents saying, I don't want to deal with an ATM. I don't want to bank online. I want to go and see my bank. I want to go to see my teller. I want to see that person physically. We've clearly as a society evolved now where most people don't want to be caught in a bank at all for any reason. They're quite comfortable using their apps. They're quite usable using, you know, lots of other services rather than going into a bank. I think chatbots have the same kind of connotation in some organizations. People still have this belief that I have to engage with another human being or the quality of service isn't high. And the reality is that's, gen that's a generational comment more often than not. Most people my age uh, and junior to me are quite happy to engage with a chatbot for a few reasons. One, we can choose when we, when we engage. So we're not dependent on their schedule, which is what happens when you have a human being present. Chatbots don't take vacations. They don't take time off. We can engage them when it suits us. The second thing is that the chatbot is going to be able to reallocate or move work that is that traditional kind of frontline transactional requests can go through the chatbot versus putting in front of somebody's lap in the organization that could be doing other things. So a good example in HR would be is, you know, how many vacation days do I have left that I can use in my vacation bank? I could email somebody in the organization and ask them to look it up for me and then send me the information, or I could email the chatbot and they would just send me an answer back in real time. 
What I also like about chatbots is that specifically if you have a multinational organization or an organization where multiple languages are spoken, you can configure your chatbot to be able to respond in multiple languages. So you can really create a good UX for the employees in the same way that marketers have been introducing chatbots to help with the sales pipeline, the sales conversion. So we apply the same kind of outside in mentality and invert it and start to treat employees more like customers, which I think is ultimately the right decision. Now back to the question and how you let the data speak. What we've done with chatbots is we've used chatbots to essentially support the analytics action planning process because that's where a lot of things fall apart. I mentioned first part of this conversation, a lot of organizations are missing the so what. They, they collect the data, they dashboard the data, they talk about the data, but if there's no actions taken against the data, then it's just numbers on a spreadsheet. So what we do is we would work with companies and in some cases, depending on their scope of, of work, embed a chat bot into the action planning process so we can use that to do some basic analyses of, of trends and to provide nudges to people along the way to say, hey, you should look at this, or hey, have you thought about this particular trend? We use it almost in a, in a frontline transactional coaching way to give people more comfort around that. And then we pair that with an actual consultant that can go a level or two deeper and dig into the root causes of the issues to address that. So I think that's one way that we've used chatbots. The other thing I would just say on chatbots is I, I love chatbots and surveys as a mechanism of collecting data where it's not present. So another question that I get in addition to how do you start is, well, what if I don't have the data that I need, Matt? I, I want to tell the story and I don't have the quantification of it. Well, then start. And you can start with a free SurveyMonkey account and be soliciting feedback from your employees on a scheduled intentional cadence and grab that information and you'll be able to have analytics off of it. And it will take you time to build up enough of a repository to flip it predictive. And depending on the size of your company, that could take many, many months, if not longer. But if you have a large organization, dropping in three SurveyMonkey questions across a cohort of 500 people gives you pretty compelling data right off the bat. Additionally, when it comes to kind of collecting that information and, and having that data, the chatbot can really act as that frontline concierge type service. And you can use it to survey people and ask questions in a more of a collaborative, interactive way. So I use chatbots mostly to enhance the user experience um, of people interacting with the data. I see in the future opportunities for us to, to take it a step further and actually have chatbots interact with us in more of a proactive way. We're working on that right now, but we're simply at this point taking organizations from the path of where they are into predictive analytics and into chatbots. And that's proving to be enough of a challenge without having to go one step further. If there is anything specific to financial services and software suppliers such as Google, Microsoft or Salesforce that you'd um, recommend that she sees lots of interesting internal transformations, anything that you'd recommend regarding that? Yeah, I'm reluctant to mention brand names just because I'm sensitive to the fact that my words carry weight and every situation in organizations is a bit different. Here's what I would offer for financial services and, and we work with financial services clients around the world. So what I can tell is the general profile of a financial services company for me is generally somebody who is, is quite risk averse compared to the, to the average organization. So we're thinking about risk aversion and we're thinking about data integrity and data privacy and compliance and all the regulations that you have to comply with over the course of you know, being a financial institution. So when we're building solutions or we're looking at market solutions, I'm looking for proven institutional solutions that we know are gonna be there three and five years from now. If I was a technology startup, I might be willing to take a chance on a startup you know, technology that's new in the market two years in, three years in. But if I'm a traditional institutional model, I'm gonna to go to the, the traditional institutional providers and try and get access to that solution so I know I have the certainty of that. And I'm also looking for, in amongst that, if I'm gonna make that move towards institutional models, you're also looking for the opportunity to have those institutional providers, but also ensure that those providers are able to integrate with other solutions in your ecosystem. So what I'm looking for when I'm procuring solutions in any organization is I'm looking for three things. The first one is looking for open APIs. And for those not familiar with the term, an open API is an, is an interface. It allows two systems to communicate with one another. And the benefit to an organization is that you're not doing duplicate data entry. You can type information into one system or flow it in from the outside with a CSV or a data import. And it should populate all the other systems through your API. So you're not entering in my, for example, you wouldn't be entering Matt Burns into multiple systems across your organization. Because Erica, a lot of people don't uh, may not know this, but in, in, in 
large organizations, you can have upwards of 30 unique HR technologies when you factor in scheduling, payroll, training, hiring, compensation, employee databases, analytics, claims management, it goes on and on and on and on and on. So if you're doing duplicate data entry into every single one of those solutions, you can imagine it becomes quite a task. So I think that becomes um, important with open APIs. The next one is single sign-on, which again, single sign-on is to IT what time off requests are to HR <laughs> in that nobody in IT is like relishing that next inbox request to help me reset my password. Single sign-on allows organizations to essentially put all their technologies under a single username and password. So whether you use the G Suite or Office 365, you're able to log in once and then have complete access to all the solutions in your ecosystem. And the beauty of technology is that you're able to actually control access points into what information individual managers see. So if I'm a leader in finance, for example, I would have access to everyone within my organization and my own file, but I wouldn't have access to everybody else in the organization. Whereas if I'm an HR executive, I'm gonna be able to see everybody's file. So having the access to have, open, to have single sign-on just reduces the friction of users to get to the solution. And then the last one for me is quite simply cloud-based versus on-premise servers. Again, in service to our IT department, most of them don't want to manage new on-premise servers. They want to, they want to be able to deal with vendors at a, at a glance. So in our case in Canada, we have some pretty significant restrictions around data, data privacy and where it can be stored and where it can be held. And I know that with GDPR, there's similar implications. We are very mindful of finding vendors that have cloud-based servers where the data is kept in certain jurisdictions and we have limitations around that. So we're asking those questions in the procurement process to be able to just uh, very first scrub. Do you have single sign-on? Do you have open APIs? And do you have cloud-based servers that allow us to maintain data integrity and be, and honor our privacy legislations. And if you have those three elements, we will bring you in for a conversation. And I learned this lesson, Erica, the hard way, because I did, I did about 75 tenders in my last procurement. We went through and talked to 75 unique vendors and we were able to figure out these were kind of the patterns of determining who was going to be successful and who wasn't. So, you know, it doesn't really answer the question specifically around financial services as far as the, the tool, but those are some of the considerations I'd be looking at as I'm procuring tools um, to solve for that particular industry. Oh, no, thank you. Next question. What do you think will happen now due to coronavirus and will work environments, how will that change and how will remote management change? Yeah, that's a really, really, really good question. And I've been having this chat a lot lately. The short answer is nobody really knows for sure, but I think here's some directional things that we can plan for. So I think it, it would stand to reason that the majority, not the majority, there's a portion of individuals who are not going to want to go back to work. They're, they're quite happy working from home. They may be introverts who enjoy working from home. They may be in family situations where they have spouses or, or children that have respiratory illnesses and they're not gonna place those family members at risk. Or they may have de determined that they don't wanna spend two to three hours every single day commuting to and from work. And this is a better work-life integration to work from home. So you have many reasons why you know, employees may choose to stay at home. You're also going to have employees who are rushing back to the workplace who, for example, are extroverts and are maybe living alone right now and are desperate to have physical interaction with people in, a, in you know, the workplace setting. So you have those kind of competing interests. You also have the same kind of dynamic within organizations. There are organizations that have now awoken to the reality that, wow, this actually works really well. Yeah, it was bumpy the first few weeks, but we were able to, to maintain productivity. We're able to maintain you know, business as usual type approach and nobody's here in the office. And we're actually finding benefit in that because you know, we're not having to worry about things such as enforcing a nine to five type schedule. We're not having to perhaps you know, look at commercial real estate the same way going forward and be able to make reductions in office space. And we may have the opportunity as an organization to procure different types of talent, as I mentioned, because now if I don't have to physically put someone in the office, I can procure talent from anywhere around the world if you're sitting from a remote location. And the inverse of that is there are many organizations that are dying to get their employees back into the office because they want people bums in seats in offices. So that tension is going to exist. So I think when you have those factors present, there's going to be tension at the individual level in organizations on how you accommodate certain things, on how you architect a future. My personal bias is 
I don't believe that we're in an economic framework now. We're in a thought-based economy. We've graduated from the industrial age into now the digital age. Uh, and if you call it the fourth industrial revolution, we're in a thought-based economy where there's a strong correlation between intrinsic motivation. So that's the motivation that comes from within discretionary effort, which is measured by you giving incremental effort than just the bare necessities and engagement. So discretionary effort, intrinsic motivation and engagement. And in a knowledge-based economy or a thought-based economy, the ability to extract incremental effort from your employees could be the difference between you succeeding and you not succeeding because it's so much harder to measure outputs in a thought-based economy as opposed to a manufacturing environment where I could measure Erica who's built more widgets at the end of the day. But in a thought-based economy, how do you measure creativity? How do you measure collaboration? How do you measure work-life satisfaction? It's just it's less tangible. So as a result of that, it's gonna become a more opaque conversation. But I fully anticipate there's this to be an ongoing dialogue in perpetuity as people seek to try and right size fit this situation going forward for themselves. And when you think about how we structure workplaces of the future, I think the, app, the answer is going to be we're going to have to provide options. I think we're going to have to be flexible and adaptable and empathetic enough to be able to respond to situations. So if you have that employee who has a child or a partner at home with respiratory illness, you may have to make the decision. Do you want them back in the office so bad you won't let them go? Or will you allow them to be, will you accommodate their condition and allow them to maintain their employment? I say that knowing full well that in a lot of jurisdictions, including the one that I live in, that isn't actually an option. We have a duty to accommodate legally. So if somebody came to us and said, hey, I can't come to the office because I have a child with a respiratory issue and I need to have an accommodation to work from home, we're legally obligated in Canada to accommodate that. So we would have to make that work. Other jurisdictions like the United States in some cases do not have the same requirement. So they may have to say, do we want to let somebody go or do we want to keep somebody? I expect that to occur. I also expect situations to occur where there are employees that don't want to come back to work, but there's nothing medically or regulatory wise that's preventing them from coming back to work. And they're just going to take a hard line and say, I'm not coming back to work. And if, it, if it's between me coming back or quitting, I may quit. So you, I think we're going to see that dynamic. I think what organizations should be thinking about is preventing and presenting that flexible environment that allows people to work when they want, how they want, and focuses more on the things that really matter. And that doesn't mean being in a physical workspace from nine to five chained to a desk. It means, is this person contributing to the goals that we set out for them in their role? And there's ways to manage that with technology that don't involve things like tracking screen time or grabbing screenshots throughout the day to make sure that Matt's not on YouTube and he's doing his job. If you create a really healthy environment and a place that people want to be, you don't have to monitor them so closely. But if you're creating an environment where nobody wants to be, then the, 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 the impact of that is you're going to have to become more micromanagement focused to extract the value of it. So I prefer to architect an environment where you don't have to lord over people. I don't think it's successful. I think it has declining returns. So I think flexibility is the, is the course of action that makes the most sense going forward. If there's a software as a service platform that you are using to collate insight into work patterns so that you can leverage the data and provide personalized content recommendations. Yep. Content recommendations. You just see that. So I'll answer the first half. I'm not sure if the content recommendations is a marketing context. I'm happy to respond to both. So from the first part, from, a, from a, what solutions do you use to aggregate the data and potentially visualize it and dashboard it? It can be as simple as an Excel spreadsheet or a Google Sheets document. It doesn't have to be complicated. Um, you can start with a $0 budget and build from that. If you want to get more robust, there are absolutely business intelligence tools. Microsoft has Power BI. Google has their equivalent. Um, there are organizations like Vizier that do a great job with more concierge type analytics services and people analytics. But you can start with a very basic Excel spreadsheet and a very basic Google sheet and just get good about dashboarding your information and having a conversation about the so what behind it. From there, yes, you can put that, that basic information into a Vizier solution, into a Power BI, into a Tableau. And organizations like us, for example, do develop customized proprietary algorithms for clients based on their unique needs. And you can do that now. It's becoming less and less expensive to build an algorithm. Three years ago, it was very, very expensive to go and get a data scientist to build an algorithm. And now that cost is coming down and down and down and down and down. 
you can do it for five figures in most cases. And the ROI on it is more often than not 10 to X or greater. So a lot of companies now are making that move uh, as they become aware of the kind of lower barrier to entry. In terms of content recommendations, is that a marketing reference, Erica? I don't know. Danette maybe can answer that question. I'm not sure. E-marketing, yes. Yeah. So the same methodology with people analytics would exist with marketing. And I've said this a few times. I actually think marketing and HR should be blended. It's inside voice, outside voice. The function is, is largely similar in a few different ways. The first way is that they're both responsible for compelling actions without any power. So marketers and HR people have to lead through influence and have to manage through influence. The only difference is that one's talking internally and one's talking externally. One's a profit function, one's a cost center, but the activities are the same. You're also in this context, surveying and collecting information on a cohort of people. You're segmenting that information into a, a cohorts and then you're preparing specific action plans to develop messaging actions and follow-ups to those distinct groups of people. In the way that marketing will push out content across multiple media channels, whether it's social, whether it's video and audio and text, HR departments are increasingly having to do things such as put out communications in multiple mediums as well. So when you look at the question of, of content, it really comes into a, a couple of different ways. The first thing you can be doing is using the same analogy of the people analytics, we can measure the efficacy of, of content marketing activities by how much your customer is engaging in that content mm -hmm. and then reverse engineer it to be able to determine the efficacy of efforts as you a b test things so even my company we put out 54 pieces of content every single week across this six social media channels and we a b test appropriate times of the day the appropriate days of the week the appropriate topics and see which ones work and then we adjust our approach on the fly going forward and then like people analytics once you have enough historical information you can provide predictive insights for people as they seek to project things into the future and you can get ahead of trends as opposed to having to react to them. So I think that answers the question, Erica. You mentioned internal recruiters. If you don't think many companies will struggle now and with HR blocking a head increase, so are recruiters being forced to show they're very busy or they're, she was asking if there's fake jobs and long interviewing processes with not a real position behind. I have had a few recruiters doing that. And if data, information and knowledge could help there. And actually, I've had a few startups ask me about recruitment, uh, startups particularly that can't afford recruiters fees. So I, I, I'll address that question because I think it's, there's a bit of nuance in it. So there are organizations right now who have put instituted hiring freezes in place. They've mm -hmm. said they're not they're hiring for a period of time until they understand what's going to happen going forward. I think that's in a lot of cases very prudent to ensure that you can keep the longevity of the, of the firm going forward, mm -hmm. to not fill positions that are not strategically important or may not have a direct business imperative today. There are also organizations that are, that are hiring like crazy. I know companies that are scaling and they're going up dramatically in headcount. And I know people who, organizations that are actually cutting resources. So there's many different scenarios and how recruiters internally are going to approach those scenarios will differ by the organization. Mm -hmm. To answer the question that's been presented in a scenario whereby, you know, recruiters are quote blocking headcount or HR is putting a hiring freeze in place. What recruiters should be doing in that time? Because the challenge with a, with a hiring freeze is that you're essentially putting the, the, that activity on pause with an expectation, like a furlough, that you're going to pick it up again. So it wouldn't make sense to reduce your recruiter headcount, but rather redeploy the recruiters to functions that are going to add value, which for me right now would be things like employment branding, talking about your organization publicly to draw more applicants into positions that you do have that are open. Uh, and then secondly, building relationships with the candidates that are in that pipeline. One criticism that's very fair of HR over the last 20 years is that we've migrated towards technologies like applicant tracking systems that are meant to make HR's job easier administratively, but are miserable from a candidate's experience. So you're seeing more technologies now focus on the candidate experience, provide information over a longer period of time, have more of a two-way dialogue as you're scheduling interviews and asking questions and things of that nature. But there, it, it is absolutely true that we need to shorten the time of application into job placement. And Erica, to your point, data will help with that. So what we've used data for in the past in this context is that we would actually quantify the time it takes from the time we post the job until the time that we fill the position. 
and we actually have an act. We actually have a, a measure in HR that's called, you know, uh, time to hire or requisition length. We're, we're actually measuring the time and then we're developing an average and then building strategies to reduce the time. Cause clearly when you're talking about things like productivity and operational continuity, speed is critical. If someone gives you two weeks notice and it takes six weeks to hire their replacement, that's a four week gap where you don't have resourcing to get that job done. So we want to incentivize HR and recruiters to fill them as fast as possible while also not losing the quality. So for us, we look for opportunities to enhance process during the hiring uh, phase, which could look like how fast are we getting back to people? How many interviews are we doing that are necessary versus unnecessary? How many of these tasks can we automate to expedite the amount of manual work going back and forth? And I think organizations are, I know for a fact that they're going towards more automation, using more technology, uh, because they're going to have to figure out a way, again, to operate their businesses both face-to-face and in a virtual setting. So technology allows us to expedite that, enhance the experience, and then the data allows us to measure the, the impact of the experience and make tweaks and make changes. The one thing I'll mention, Erica, before I wrap it up is that I mentioned earlier, you can be intentional about putting surveys and you can be intentional about measurement in the hiring process by just being a bit thoughtful about it. So if you don't have the measures that you're looking for again, then you can put a survey monkey in at various stages of somebody's first 90 days on day one, on day seven, on day 28, on day 60, on day 90 and ask formulaic pre-populated questions and then get the feedback on a three point or a five point or a seven point rating scale And then as you aggregate the results of day seven, of day 14, of day 28, of day 60, of day 90 for the organization, you can see where the satisfaction is high and where it drops. And if it's, if you have one certain day, let's say it's day 28, where you see the results drop off a cliff, then from there, you can identify what's happening around day 28, what's happening in that period of time that we can dig into further and increase the satisfaction versus having to look at the entire 90 day process and unpack that, which would take longer. And ultimately you may not get to a solution. So I put data in to try and almost like a litmus test what's happening here. So we can dig in a bit deeper. It doesn't give you the answer. I use, I use, I use data. The analogy I use is that I don't use data to give me the exact answer, but in the analogy of a needle in a haystack, I use data to make a smaller haystack. I don't have time to go digging around a farm full of hay to find this haystack. It makes it easier for me to find the answer when I'm able to focus my energy on the area where there's opportunities. How could an HR department measure the quantity of new hires? Yeah, quality. Yeah, I think just quality, three measures, how they perform against their targets as it relates to the business. So if you're sales, what are they driving as far as targets? I would also include some degree of peer evaluation. So how are they interacting with their coworkers? That's really important. And then of course, feedback from your customers and supervisors would be important. So I'm looking to grab as many data points as possible to give us a full picture. Otherwise it becomes a subjective exercise and that's where tension exists in the performance management process. Cool, no, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Matt, for joining.